It's a great honor to be with President Kagame. And we have uh, had tremendous uh, discussions on Rwanda. The job they've done is uh, absolutely terrific. We have trade with Rwanda. Uh, and just general, I would say, great relationships. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Mr. President, uh, as being the new head of the African Union. That's a great honor. This was just announced recently, and uh, that really truly is a great honor. So please give my regards. I know you're going to your first meeting very shortly. And please give my warmest regards. But it's an honor to have you as a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, it was a great honor to meet uh, the President of the United States, uh, President Donald Trump. And uh, we had good discussions uh, on those two levels. Uh, the, bilateral relations uh, between Rwanda and the United States. Rwanda has benefited tremendously uh, from the support of the United <coughs> States in many areas where it is in peace support operations we have carried out in different parts of the world. We had the United States on our side supporting us. We have supported our economy in trade, investment. We see a lot of uh, uh, Tourists from the United States, visitors sure. coming to Rwanda, and uh, President, I wanted to thank you for uh, the support you have received from you personally and the administration. And uh, we are looking forward to also working with the United States at the level of the African Union, where we are carrying out reforms at the African Union so that we get our act together to do the right things. and. That helps in cooperating with the United States. Uh, it would be more beneficial when we are organized to know what we want from the United States sure. for that cooperation. So I thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much. And it's a great honor to have all of you here. And uh, we'll speak for a little bit longer. And thank you very much. Thank you. Your Highnesses, the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall for being with us this week. We have just concluded a successful chogun, the conclusions of which are contained in the communique and the leader's statement circulated earlier. We have admitted Gabon and Togo as new members and we warmly welcome them to the Commonwealth family. There has been good participation throughout, both in terms of numbers of leaders in attendance, as well as the valuable contributions made on issues that are important to all of us. We are all committed to values of the Commonwealth, no question, but it's not for one group to define and measure who lives up to it. The Commonwealth is diverse and we respect that diversity. As chair in office, we look forward to working towards strengthening the partnerships within the Commonwealth for the benefit of all our citizens. I thank you. I now welcome the Secretary General to deliver our remarks. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, and good evening, everyone. For the first time in four years, Commonwealth heads of government have enjoyed two days of open, intensive, and fruitful face-to-face -face discussions. This follows a week of dialogue and consensus building involving every part of our great Commonwealth family. Very briefly, I want to say how humbled I am to have been reappointed as Secretary General to be able to complete my second term. To serve the Commonwealth is a great honor.
and a privilege, and I will do so to the best of my ability until I hand on the baton to Africa following the next heads of government meeting in two years' time. Foremost in our discussions were the major challenges facing our Commonwealth and the wider world, including the impacts of conflict and the COVID-19 pandemic, and the really urgent threat of climate change. We affirmed the importance of equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines as a key to global recovery from the pandemic. We discussed Commonwealth priorities around governance, human rights, the rule of law, sustainability, and the key issues related to trade and economic growth. And we reflected on the particular impact these challenges have on our small states. You will know that of the 54 countries in the Commonwealth, 32 are small states. A number of new principles, declarations, and frameworks were endorsed, and you will find them all in our communique, but key to them were the following. The Living Lands Charter, a call to action on living lands, which seeks to put into place actions to support the three Rio conventions. The Kigali Declaration on Childcare Reform, the Declaration on Sustainable Urbanization, and last but not least, the Declaration on Gender Equality and women's empowerment. These instruments will serve as guiding frameworks for the work of the Commonwealth in the years ahead, complementing the vital work the Secretariat already does on issues on the environment, democracy, and anti-corruption to connectivity, health, and education. Heads of government wish to formally send their congratulations to Her Majesty the Queen in the year of her Platinum Jubilee. And I am delighted to confirm that the Commonwealth she has served with such devotion will grow from 54 to 56 nations as we welcome the Gabonese Republic and the Togolese Republic into our family today. I place on record my thanks to the United Kingdom and Prime Minister Johnson for their concerted efforts during their extended term as chair in office. And on behalf of the whole Commonwealth, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to my dear friend, President Kagame and his government, along with the people of Rwanda for their warm welcome and their absolutely stunning hospitality. His Excellency President Kangami has guided us skillfully through our discussions, and the skill that was required was a delight to see. And Rwanda has shown herself to be a credit to the Commonwealth. I welcome here my brothers, the presidents of Guyana, and Sierra Leone, and my dear sister, the Prime Minister of Samoa. And I'm delighted to announce the decision today that Samoa will host the next Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 2024. This Chogham has been a long time in coming. We moved forward from Kigali with a clear mandate with unity, with purpose, and with the resolve to shape a healthier, happier, more secure, and more prosperous future for all of the Commonwealth, 2.5 billion people. And it's really important for us to remember that 60% of that 2.5 billion are under the age of 30. So it's a young, <coughs> vibrant Commonwealth. And with a shared determination to make the Commonwealth an ever more 
influential force for good around the world. It has been a remarkable chogam, and we congratulate the president and the people of Rwanda for all they have shared so generously with us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Secretary General and President Kadep Gami. Um, we'd now like to invite questions from members of the media. If you could state your organisation, state your name, and um, indicate that you'd like to ask a question, then I will um, put your question to the relevant um, head of state here. Um, would anybody like to ask a question? Okay, sorry, the gentleman here in the orange. Thank you. Uh, Urakoze nyakuwa Presida wa Repubulika nitwa Paul Rutika ngankorera RBA muri nama ya Chogam mwatorewe kuyobora uyu muryango mu gihe cy'imyaka 2 iri imbere ni ibihe bikorwa mutekereza gushyiramo imbaraga cyane Urakoze Sorry would you be able to ask your question in English for members of the international media as well is that okay Sorry to pressure Thank you uh, another I would like to ask Secretary General uh, Your Excellency, uh, my name is Paul Tikang, as I said, and I work from, I'm from Rwanda Broadcasting Agency. Uh, your Excellency, as you conclude this meeting, what is your general impression in relation uh, to its preparation and takeaway messages? Thank you. Well, I think absolutely everyone I've spoken to have just been amazed by what they have seen here in Uanda. The organization has been superb. The uh, preparations are second to none. And the spirit that has been shared with us has been frankly astounding. Every single person I've spoken to has told me how surprised they have been to see what has been achieved in Rwanda over the last 28 years. Some said to me they thought this was a miracle, that when you looked at where Rwanda had been in 1994 and you see where Rwanda is now, it is breathtaking. But the most important thing about Rwanda has been its resilient and kind people. People have shown us warmth and consideration, and I think all of us will go away never forgetting the comradeship, the sensitivity, and frankly, just the kindness that we've all been shown. Real, real generosity. So I think President Kagami from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of the 2.5 billion people that I represent, particularly the young people, I want to say a profound thank you because the young people, if I can talk colloquially, they had a ball. Do you want to respond? Okay, thank you. Uh, the gentleman on the end here, if that's okay. Hello, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ayubu Mze, and I work for Ben Television Sky Channel 182 in London, but I'm originally from Tanzania. I've got two questions, but, but before I put forward my two questions, I want to thank the Commonwealth, that even though I was born in Tanzania, it is the Commonwealth that has brought me to Rwanda to see the good story I've been reading about Rwanda. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. My question is, uh, I as a, a disabled person, I'm putting this question to the incoming chairman. I faced a lot of difficulties for the last six days. I've not been able to leave my hotel because I'm disabled. And uh, the I could not leave my hotel for the last six days because I'm disabled. And uh, I, th I thought Rwanda is a disabled-friendly country, as I was told. 
but for the last two days I've had some help like you can see now. So what steps are you going to take to make sure that Rwanda and even the whole Commonwealth is all inclusive and accessible and disabled friendly, sir? Mm -hmm. And that goes to the Samoa head of government. I'm coming to Samoa, you will see me, but as a disabled person, what do you promise me? Thank you. Well, first of all, I must apologize to you directly and personally, but also on behalf of my government. Uh, ordinarily, and, and maybe you hear about it or you see in other circumstances, we have actually put in place policies to take care of the needs of disabled people, including giving them representation in the parliament. They are there. If you look at some of the details, even in the infrastructure provisions for the disabled people are there. Maybe they are not everywhere. And that's what I want to come to. I think it is always going to be a problem in, in terms of detailed implementation of things we have intended to do. Uh, so, and that's where things must have gone wrong, and, and that's what I'm apologizing for. It means that we have almost the intention, I mean, we have the intention, we have almost everything in place, but somehow people who should be connect, connecting solutions to the need uh, fall short in many cases. So taking note of what you just said, uh, I hope we, we, we can work together in our own system and with the needed people to improve on where we fell short. We have a very active uh, disabilities uh, organization, uh, especially with the advocacy in, to government uh, to put in place uh, policies. Um, I appreciate um, the question, and it's on issues of accessibility or ease of accessibility. I think a lot of countries have a, a varied um, ability to respond. Um, you've said, what can you expect from us? Um, well, because in planning these events, um, and your particular question has now put on the, on the books what we need to ensure that uh, we can provide for uh, special needs. Um, and, you know, we're a developing country, and where our facilities may not have ease of uh, accessibility, you can be assured you will have some very fit Samoan people working with you to assist you. Thank you. Um, could we get a question here from the gentleman with his arm raised? Thank you very much, um, Your Excellency. Your Excellency is um, Secretary General. Thank you so much. My name is Vincent Gasana. I work with KT Press. Um, if I may, first, um, Your Excellency President Kagame, uh, your uh, chair in office for the next two years, uh, 54 nations, more than 2 billion people, um, very weighty issues that have been discussed, and presumably Your Excellency is going to have to link an awful lot of them. Um, it's probably too soon to have um, thought about that, but would you tell us what um, you envisage the issues are going to be to be able to link all these issues and keep everybody um, focused on them um, so that the, it goes to implementation. Everything that was discussed goes in to implementation, especially, of course, uh, climate change. Um, and if I may, Secretary General, I mean, we um, say a lot in Rwanda um, that no miracle has happened here. It's been people working day by day, every year, to get things done, um, 
you know, government working with people and so on. Um, may I wonder um, if, as, uh, I mean, also may I say congratulations for the, your uh, next two terms. May I wonder if, you know, really Rwanda ought to be not necessarily a stick to beat the others, but an example to the others. If Rwanda can do it with all the disadvantages it has had, um, all the other 54 should be doing a great deal better. Um, and very quickly to Samoa, if I may, um, congratulations also for the 2024. And may I ask, what are the main um, takeaways you think you'll take from Rwanda uh, to go and s that have been most successful here and repeat again um, in Samoa? Thank you very much indeed. Well, to, to start with, look, no, no, nobody uh, has any illusions about uh, the challenges uh, and how these challenges will always, I mean, manifest maybe in different forms or will, uh, you know, change in the future. You are facing problems today of a different kind. Tomorrow there are different challenges. But the 54 countries of the Commonwealth, each one of them, like any other countries out of the Commonwealth, we have specific challenges. But the countries altogether have also common challenges. But it's not about challenges alone. It's, it's, I think we have even more opportunities than the challenges we have. So we start with individual country, confronting what they have to confront. And then we have this family of nations, uh, countries, coming together to actually confront the common challenges to all of them. In the same way, that's how we tap into the opportunities available to each country, but also work together to be able to benefit from the opportunities we share or we can find in each other. So that's the way to proceed in the theory. But we have to also proceed in the practice. Once we understand what the challenges are, what the opportunities are, in the practical terms, we have then to work together as members of the same family and aggregate these benefits that are there in the opportunities, as well as put together our energies to deal with the challenges. So my responsibility and working together with the Secretariat and the Secretary General and working together with other nations of the Commonwealth we have to identify then these practical ways of moving forward and making good progress. So it's always going to be how much we pull along each other, how much we work together, and we can do it in such a way that even together we can keep measuring the progress we are making. Uh, so that it is not just talk, talk, talk all the time. It's, it's about doing things as well. That's what I believe. And there's a way to get a feel that there has been more action than just talk. So really this is what I feel is uh, at hand in terms of responsibilities that we all share. And. Uh, as I said, working with the 
other members of the Commonwealth and the Secretariat being at the center, helping us to connect uh, more and more. I think we, we should realize uh, tangible results. So if I can um, come now to the answer the questions you asked me. Firstly, I think, as I made clear, someone else said that this was a miracle. I know <laughs> from having spoken to so many Rwandans that this was an enormous effort and it was only achieved by every single Rwandan being determined to rebuild a country that they loved. But I think one of the things that we've all seen is it's built on inspirational leadership. And I'm going to ask um, the president of Guyana maybe just to help us about that in a minute. But can I say the way in which our Commonwealth works is that we look at what joins us and not what separates us. And we know we're stronger together than we are apart. So if you look at the declarations we've made, the Living Lands Charter, a call to action on living lands, we know that we are at code red when it comes to climate change and that the small member states are facing a crisis which could be existential. And we know that implementation of the three Rio conventions absolutely vital. So what we're going to do is all our countries are coming together and we are going to cluster ourselves in order for us to respond more creatively, more intelligently and more effectively. And we don't just come together every two years, we have ministerial meetings. So the ministers of health will meet, the ministers of education, the ministers of environment are now going to meet, the ministers of women meet, the ministers in relation to youth will meet next January in Pakistan. So it's the culmination of all of that work, which means that we are able to deliver more, spend less, and help each other to do good. That's the whole point of the Commonwealth. And we, I've been saying for a very long time, and we've been doing it, we want to put the wealth back into Commonwealth, but we also want to put the common back into wealth. And if you look at what we've done on trade and the way we've built that Commonwealth advantage in terms of delivering intra-Commonwealth trade, it's gone up. We're now about 762 billion in intra-Commonwealth trade, and we hope to be 2 trillion by 2030. But I'll now pass the ball over to uh, President Ali from Guyana. Thank you very much, <clears throat> SG. Members of the media, perhaps if we can sum this up, <clears throat> what the world needs now and Commonwealth needs now is stability, bold, innovative, and visionary thinking. And the combination of our SG and the incoming chair offers us a great opportunity. When you look at what President Kagame has achieved here with the people of Rwanda, it tells about a leader in a country that has a vision, bold initiatives, creative initiatives. And that when you look at the crisis and insecurities we are facing in the world today, food crisis, energy crisis, a climate crisis, a crisis of inequality, we require this type of leadership and these characteristics to navigate us through these difficult paths. And I think President Kagame coming in at this time as chair will help greatly the Commonwealth family to navigate through uh, this path and with the SG bringing that stability and pushing those programs, I think we have an excellent opportunity to confront these challenges. And I said to President Kagame a few moments ago that many times the developing world 
will look to the, to the developed world for answers and best practices. What Rwanda has shown the developing world is that we can have the answer among ourselves and within ourselves too. And it is this type of leadership and example by doing that is required in creating some of the changing circumstances that is so critically needed. So having a chair that brings that experience in a practical way, I think allows us to have something that is functional, direct, and creative in dealing with the challenges that we'll confront. I want to congratulate the President, His Excellency, and the people of Rwanda for an exceptional conference. And to say that your hard work in building this country, building this city, was on show. And it has gained tremendous respect. Thank you. Um, we are running out of time, so if we have a couple of questions, they could be quick. And if someone would be able to direct some of those questions towards on the outcomes of the communique and of Chobham, that would be helpful as well. Um, sorry? I, I think there was a part for me in that question. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Apologies. Just, sorry. just very quickly, what's the takeaway from here? We, we had an intergenerational discourse this morning with representatives from the leaders and um, the youth delegates to the Youth Forum. Um, and there were two things that I came away with from that meeting, and I think um, it applies to the whole um, Chogham experience. And this is uh, with respect to, to development. And the first thing is whole of society approaches because quite often this is a, a body of uh, governments. Um, but what has become very clear is that it's not enough uh, to just have governments determine the, the development um, uh, program and objectives. It has to be a whole of society uh, to carry us through if we want to reach the goals that we've set. Um, one of the clear messages that, that came through, especially from, from the youth delegates, is the idea of the opportunity that we now have at this juncture, especially with COVID and climate change, and the impacts that it has had globally, that it's an opportunity to reimagine uh, our futures. Um, and, you know, we talked about education, how you know, that might look like in terms of the needs uh, that are there, the framing, uh, especially around um, funding and financing uh, for small island states. Uh, this is always a challenge and it's an opportunity to work with partners to, to do that reimagining um, exercise. I, I'm particularly taken uh, with President Kagame's leadership I think generally there's cynicism about uh, governments and leadership. Coming to uh, Rwanda, um, I think it, it's a very reaffirming uh, experience, at least for myself, you know, in terms of the roles um, and the functions that leaders um, can provide for countries. Um, and, you know, no leader does anything by themselves. But leadership is also being able to take people along with you. And I think Rwanda has been an excellent um, example of that through the leadership of President Kagame. Uh, last thing um, is the logistics. Uh, we've hosted uh, a few uh, major conferences in Samoa, and most notably the SIDS conference. Um, in 2014, so it's 10 years. And I think, although we've yet to determine the themes uh, for the meeting um, in, in Samoa, but it will be another um, good opportunity uh, to refocus the Commonwealth on small, on small states, 
uh, and to review what had been determined through the SIDS conference and the SAMO pathway uh, that was developed uh, to review how we have progressed in terms of what had been uh, determined as a blueprint uh, for um, SIDS. Logistically, it's going to be an island experience. I've been to, this is my third jog Chogum. Uh, the first one was in Edinburgh in the late 90s, and uh, the second one was in Perth about 10 years ago. Um, so these are very diverse um, hosting um, environments. Um, it will be an island environment, um, and it is very important for the Commonwealth uh, family to experience and to, you know, physically visit these places. And um, I know myself, there's so many places in the Commonwealth that I have not been to. And I know from talking with colleagues from different parts of the Commonwealth family that a lot of them have never been to our part of the world. And this is one of the wonderful things about the Commonwealth, is that we get to experience personally, as we have done here in Rwanda, and it's such a fantastic experience of you know, how we can live and improve uh, the lives of our respective uh, peoples uh, through the joint uh, work that we do together. Moderator, may I suggest something, some practical effort? In the interest of time, um, if you may ask anybody, that whoever wants to ask, direct a question to somebody whom they want to ask, sure. instead of somebody asking three questions and then dividing, you know, otherwise we leave this room with only maybe three or four people having asked, and you could have had 10 or 20. Do you think? No, I, I absolutely agree, Mr. President. I'd also think we'd all love to hear the reflections from uh, President of Sierra Leone, who has been with us through thick and thin. And if you see, we have Africa, we've got Caribbean, and we've also got the Pacific. And I'm going to represent all the other regions. <laughs> okay. So maybe we could have uh, Sierra Leone. Maybe, uh, maybe President Maya would like to say something about his experience? <clears throat> well, um, my experience here is not strange because I've been here before today, uh, before the Strogom, and um, I came here purposely because of the brilliant work that has been done in this country by the leadership and the people. And one thing that comes out clearly is the fact that when the people, when you have the right leader and the people are willing to follow you can do great things, and that is what um, um, Rwanda has done. Yeah, I mean, nobody can come here and not congratulate you. The leadership, for him, he has a duty, and uh, that's how he sees it. Uh, when you tell him about certain things, he say, no, that is my function, and that is what I'm providing leadership. But to the people of Rwanda, when um, somebody said a miracle, it, it is a miracle. When you look at the circumstances, when you look at how far you've come, when you look at the many distractions around the world, you have done a great thing for which we must commend you. Um, for our colleague, uh, uh, His Excellency, I've told him severally, and um, the first time I came here, I, I told him I was saying my own people to come and look at how you have done it, what, what makes you tick, what make your people follow you. So for me, um, the reception has been great, the organization around Chogum has been great, and it is indeed a representation of where Africa wants to go. This is what you have done is aspirational for Africa. Um, and we, I want to say thank you for representing, showing the best of what we can do if we work with our people. Um, Nick Perry from AFP. Uh, my question is for the Secretary General. Um, good governance, uh, democracy are bedrock principles of the Commonwealth and its charter. 
and, and tonight you, you've announced that Gabon and Togo have, have joined uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, both those countries um, are under well, dynastic rule. They have the same families that have been in power for over 50 years and they've held elections that have been marred by irregularities and, and violence. Um, do you think that the Commonwealth uh, risks credibility on matters related to good governance and democracy by allowing such countries to become part of the family of nations? And, um, and, and, and what sort of power does the Commonwealth have to encourage better governance from its members? Well, I think the first thing to say is before any country is invited to join the Commonwealth, there's a five-stage process where we are able to go with that country, look at the processes they have, look at the commitment they have to governance, the rule of law, and the charter. And one of the most important things is that the Commonwealth is here to walk with those who have put their face clearly on a path for maintaining good governance. And the interesting question is why would any country want to join our Commonwealth? And the answer is simple. If you look, for example, at the Mo Ibrahim Good Governance Index, you will see that the majority of countries, and we had before 19 countries in Africa, the majority of the members of our Commonwealth are either in the top 10 countries or in the second tier. So they're either premiership or their first division. Now many other countries are looking at what we are doing and saying what is it about them that enables them to govern more robustly. And the Commonwealth has had a history of, of giving Commonwealth technical assistance. So for example, we have just concluded training 2,000 senior Commonwealth government officials in every region of the Commonwealth on the performance management principles of good governance. And we've created a system which has been capable of being shared with all our 54 countries. And on the 6th of June, the cabinet secretaries of our countries met to see if there couldn't be an agreement about the generally agreed performance management principles. We're calling it the gap. This had never been done before, but it has now been achieved. And just like accountancy principles, it enables you to objectively assess the quality and the nature of the delivery of good governance. And we hope that this tool, which has been created with our member states in conjunction with them, but by the Secretariat, will be an objective guide by which we can assist our countries to determine whether they are doing that which they properly should do in order to deliver good governance. At the moment, for so many of us, the assessment of government performance is either good, bad, or ugly, but it is a subjective as opposed to an objective analysis. What the Commonwealth Secretariat has just delivered is a way in which we can objectively assess how well our countries are doing and assist them to do better. The tragedy in our world is that there is not one country I can think of who can honestly say they are without error, in need of improvement, or opportunities to change. So what our Commonwealth is doing is coming together in humility, looking at what works, looking at what doesn't work, and helping to strengthen us all. So we welcome both Gabon and Togo in the spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood and a determination that we need a safer and better world. And we're better together than we ever will be apart. Thank you. Just uh, last question, um, the lady at the back there. Thank you very much. My name is Ansoy from the BBC. I have a quick question. 
uh, for President Kagame. Uh, as chair of the Commonwealth, um, I wonder what your priority will be, uh, especially in terms of upholding the values of democracy and human rights, given that there's been a lot of scrutiny on your country and the record of your government and uh, critics have been pointing out the number of opposition leaders and journalists who are in prison. Uh, I wonder how, what your leadership of this uh, organization is going to look like uh, in the face of that. And uh, tied to that uh, is also uh, the criticisms that have been directed at your government as well uh, over the migrants deal. Uh, they have raised questions of human rights, but also questioning whether your government by entering this deal allows the British government to abdicate its responsibility towards refugees. May I ask a final question to the SG, please? Um, in the run-up to this event, uh, Madam SG, there were questions about, um, the, 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 um, there were concerns that your office was withholding an important review of its finances, and uh, some member states have been particularly um, unhappy about that. Now that you have won, uh, re-election or reappointment, what actions are you going to take on this report and to restore their confidence? Thank you. Well, the first thing to say in relation to that is that there has been, I'm afraid, a graphic misrepresentation. And I'm really disappointed that before the BBC issued that story, they did not correctly ascertain what the position is. In fact, the report about which you speak is a report which was asked for by the leaders to assess the quality and the amount of money that the Secretariat should need in order to deliver all its mandates in the future. You will know, if, and I'm sure the BBC will have had access to the Transparency International data, which we publish consistently in relation to every 500 pounds spent by the Secretariat. And you will know, because I'm sure in due diligence as good journalists, you would have checked your facts, that we have had a clean bill of health for every single year of my stewardship. And indeed, if you look at the governance measures, I, we moved from the Secretariat from a C-rated organization to an A+. So we have been verifiably robust in the financial management. But we do have a problem. When I took up office in 2016 of the Commonwealth Secretariat, it was said that we were standing on a burning platform. The sums of money available to the Secretariat were insufficient really to meet our needs, and we had to reform it dramatically in order to remain a viable organization. Now, as a result of that, we have had to work very hard to make sure that we have money in the bank and that we can continue to work. But there was a big issue, because although we were delivering 97% of the strategic plan and the delivery plan, the money that was available to us was not structured in such a way that it would make it easy for us to maintain that high performance. Therefore, the leaders asked a question. Bearing in mind our finances at the moment are given in three forms. One has a formula for the amount of money that members pay to, uh, to in effect, be a member of our club. The second is a voluntary fund for Commonwealth's financial technical assistance about which we were speaking. And the third fund is a fund for youth projects. Now, those three funds have three separate audit trails, and we must be the most audited organization known to man, yet we have less than 42 million pounds to do it all. So the question that was raised in 2018 by the leaders was how do we put the secretariat, who they said at that stage were doing a remarkably good job, on a more sustainable footing? That is the question that EY was asked to address. It was nothing about the financial circumstances of the secretariat. It was how do we put 
an organization which is seeking to serve 54 countries with a budget of only 42 million on a more sustainable footing. Now, there were terms of uh, the uh, terms of conditions of that contract, and all that was happening is that a report that was submitted was being discussed with EY in order to come to an amicable solution. It is deeply, deeply disappointing that the BBC, who have such a remarkable reputation, should have failed adequately to assure themselves of the facts which could have been easily checked by looking on Transparency International before making what you may now feel was an ill-judged and inappropriate comment. But I thank you for giving me this wonderful opportunity to clear it up. Right. Um, I think checking of facts is a, a serious problem with the, the very institutions we should have relied on to inform the public, the general public, the world about some of these facts. Or whether the facts themselves or the interpretation of some of the things that actually happen. Now, let me start with the, the issue of values. Who defines the values? Or who doesn't actually have values? When people talk about values sometimes, there's one part of the world that has assumed the sole responsibility and the monopoly of defining values. So the rest of us have no values. We've just to keep learning from these ones who define the values. And, and by the way, the danger also is, it doesn't matter how you, long you take learning, you will never qualify. You will just always be branded somebody who has no values or who comes from a place where there are no values. So I want to put this case clear. Those from the north who always assume where BBC comes from, who always think they are the face of values, the rest have to follow. It's a big mistake. It's not true. We have values too. We here in Rwanda, in Africa, we do. No question about it. Second, there are some of these problems we have had in our continent, in Rwanda. Those from the north who define or want to define values have been part and parcel of these problems we have been facing. Some of them have actually been the cause of the problems we face. But at the same time, like, like the genocide here that, that took place here in Rwanda, where one million people over were killed. Well, I remember, if your memory serves you well too, I'm not inventing anything. The debate that went on at the UN, it was like, you know, these uh, developed rich countries, those who define values, simply took it like, these are just Africans killing each other. These debates were in the open. But you think that is true? You think the divide 
that actually led to this genocide was just the creation of Rwandans, not the people from the north who actually divided this country, told the people to think of themselves as belonging to one ethnic group and the other to think as belonging to one another ethnic group and therefore they should kill each other. Not only are they different, but they should kill each other. Would you believe that? Would you tell me that the two, 20 million people, this is documented by other people, not by me, who were killed in the Congo, were killed by other Congolese in the old days of King Leopold? And you think all that just disappeared in a moment then you had the savages coming over and taking over their own countries and killing each other. And then the others assume the higher ground, they are up there in the north and keep pointing fingers at those of us and think we have no values and we just uh, are there to, you know, we don't respect freedoms, we don't respect human rights. We, sure, do you think so? BBC, you think so? You take time, you broadcast, and from morning to evening, you, this is literally just abusing people. You're abusing Rwandans, you're abusing Africans, you values, values, values. What values do you know, my dear sister, on behalf of BBC? So I want to assure you, there is nobody in the BBC or anywhere else there about who would be holding values better than we do here in Rwanda. Except if we just want to cover up the mistakes of the same people who want to define these values for us. Or really tragic mistakes of things they have caused. So, when you are saying that, you may tell somebody else, people who don't have time to think or who don't have a history that, where they have struggled with these complications, yes, they will, but here, those of us who have faced what we did, who have gone through what we did, we take our responsibility. Of course, genocide could not have happened just on the hands of others who brought it to us. No. We, Rwandans, have a responsibility. We, we have our share of the blame for it. But there are others who should take responsibility for that. So I, I just want to let you know that these issues of upholding values and so on, as far as I'm concerned, as I know, as far as the Rwandans are concerned, we don't need any lessons from BBC or from anyone. I, I, I tell you this with firm conviction. So, democracy or people in prison you're talking about, there's nobody in Rwanda who is in a prison that should not be there because you have a justice system that is actually functional and is fair. Let me tell you something instead. Actually, there are people who are not in a prison who should be there. There are no people who are in prison that shouldn't be there. But there are people who are not in prison who actually should be there. And I will explain to you if you want. I know, for example, I've been seeing uh, uh, journalists uh, writing all kinds of things. Take somebody, praise her or him, and make them uh, champions of all kinds of things, that's fine. I wish 
these people are making them champions of their own situations, if, that's, if they wanted them, but not of our situations. And I give you some details. And what I meant when I said what I said. Take an example who is always written about and people who have been here even during this chogam and they were visiting. There's a, a woman called Ingavire, Victor, whom BBC and others want to always sing about being the face of the opposition. Of the, okay, fine. And this is one I was referring to. She's not in prison now, but should actually have, should be in prison now. She was in prison, she committed a crime for which she was tried in the court of law. She was actually sentenced and imprisoned. The government, the president, under the prerogative of the mercy, president has that powers. Actually, this woman was released from prison before she served her full sentence. And it wasn't because she was not guilty or whatever. I'll tell you something else which shows double standards, which lead to these things you were asking. She was tried on the basis of evidence that was provided by European countries working with our own justice system. You see, so it wasn't just done here. It was done between us and some European countries who provided evidence corroborating with that with the evidence we had and that's on the basis of which she was tried and sentenced and put in prison. Now, but some people decide to make that person an angel of freedom and democracy and something like that. Where, where does it come from? But she's out there, she's not in prison. But this I'm saying, she would actually be in a prison if we hadn't just forgiven her. Okay, we forgave her to be out of prison so that you can pick her and pump her and praise her. Okay, that's fine. If that's, uh, if that serves. But I wish it was serving something good for the country. That's okay. Then you have uh, another person whom uh, the very people I was referring to picked, praised, made him a celebrity, you know, made the hero of, made him a savior of, but I, I don't know even what he saved. Now, when he faces justice, there is evidence, irrefutable evidence, he was tried in the court of law publicly. Nobody questions the facts on which the evidence is based. But then say, no, 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 you see this one is, you know, a critic of the president. No, you first answer these facts before you talk about your, your things that you want to use. And in fact, this person committed this crime with many others. There are about 21 people in the same case, all of them who pleaded guilty and are implicating this person. And this person was at one time their leader. These are people who were armed, waged violence against families of Rwandans. People who were lost their lives. There are victims there. And then there is the one, you know, this person, you know, it comes from America, from Europe, and that this person, and in fact, what is interesting, they come and say, this person, we are not saying he's innocent, but he should be released. And then we ask them, say, okay, if you think he should be released, how about these others who are co-accused with this person who are also in prison? 
So in other words, they are saying, this person is special. We've made him special, so you should not question that. And then we say, okay, fine. How about the victims? The very people, families that lost their people on the hands of this person. They can't answer that, but they keep insisting. So anyway, I'm just, let me try to cut. It was a loaded question, so I'm trying to grapple with how to cut the answer short, but. So the, the, the basis on which the these judgments are, are, are made is not necessarily right. It's not correct. Um, so I let you make a decision at some point what to believe or what you should be making other people believe, but uh, I know by my answer in whatever way, maybe you're already framing a completely different story about what I said or giving it a frame in which I, I didn't put it, but that's okay. Let me quickly talk about the migration problem. with the UK. The migration problem arises out of so many things that have been happening even before we had anything to do with the UK migration issue. We have so many refugees here in Rwanda. Congolese refugees, Burundi refugees, Many, in their tens of thousands, that is one. Number two, in 2018, we decided, at that time I was the chair of the African Union, that we help out on this case of Libya. Many Africans through Libya, by up to now, they are still caught up there. They've been brought from Libya over time, brought here, processed here. Some of them are still here. A thousand of them so far have been processed and taken abroad to Europe, to Canada, to United States. But we just saved a situation where thousands of young Africans were caught up in Libya. They were trying to get to Europe. They were not getting there. They got stuck. They were imprisoned. They were in jail. Then they, they were even being slaves. There were people coming to buy them as slaves and take them to some places. So we said, we offered something to the international community. We told them, look, instead of having these people suffering in Libya, can we have them in Rwanda so that those countries that want to help out either to return them to where they came from or to take them to places that can accept them? The reminder, those who want to stay with us, we can even make them stay here. We have no problem. Those are three options. And that's how the UNHCR, UNHCR got involved other international institutions got involved, and the process has been going on since, since 2018. Now, on this one, I mean, because I have seen with this UK uh, partnership, people tried to imply that there is a man involved. It's like we are just being paid to have these people. You may find out for yourself, investigate, if anybody gave us money about the Libyan case. There was no money. In fact, the, what, what happened was the international community helped to transport them, bring them here. We provided a place. 
and they also started supporting these people, and that's how it has been going. In fact, we, we had that situation, we had another case where we, Israel remembers throwing out some migrants also who had gone there from Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, who also helped on that. That is way before this case of... Uh, so what is happening today is no different from what was happening there. Now, and this question of money involved that people are talking about, largely it is money to look after these people who are being brought here because they are not accepted in the other side, on the other side. Now, so if we have a situation like this, first of all, it also builds on our position in terms of how we see the migration issue. While there might be a right of a person to flee and seek refuge in some place, it's not going to be anybody. Because in this one, there are two types of criminals, if I may say. There are actually people who have been finding their way to whichever place that you don't even deserve to be accepted by those places. It's not automatic. That when you say, I want to go to UK, I want to go to France, I want to go to Belgium, I want to go to Spain, that you must always be accepted. No, it depends on why you are going to that place. Are you somebody running away from persecution or from serious problems? Yeah, but this, there is a case here. People should be able to listen to that. But at the same time, it's up to that country to decide what they do in that case. There is nothing automatic about it. But in fact, some of the cases involve criminality. People simply either escape justice for committing different types of crime, and when they are going to whichever place, there is no automaticity about accepting them under migration laws. I think this must be accepted as a fact. Two, there is a criminality that involves slave trades, like they are trading them. These uh, people who, there is a, a network of criminals that uh, actually do business with this. That is known, the, the, the criminal networks are known in Africa or in Europe. So if countries are trying to say, no, we have to have orderly migration, what's wrong with that? I have no problem with that. And it doesn't matter where they are coming from, whether it is Europe or Asia or wherever. By the way, we also, not so long ago, accepted people from Afghanistan. We still have young people who are living here who came from Afghanistan. We received requests that people were looking for where to go because they were fleeing what happened in Afghanistan, and we accepted these people. These people are still here. They are attending school. They are living a normal life, no more in, in in that limited sense. No more situation should be that they live in their country, but here we try to do our best to give them a sense of security and normalcy, but which is not complete. These people are here. They are being helped by different organizations, philanthropies. Nobody is giving this country money to do that. Absolutely not. So I wanted to, in those long explanations of words, to assure you that this migration issue 
is um, something that people will have different views about. But I have tried to explain to you where we come from in dealing with it the way we deal with it. So for us, are we committing any crime in accepting these people to come here? But if they don't come, we won't complain. It's not like we are dying to have people come to us, no, in this month. It's just, it's just that we have tried to help out. So what else do you want me to say? Uh, at the end of the day, this Rwanda, where we have come from, maybe we know, maybe you will know or you will know. We are happy with the progress we are making. We want more progress. <laughs> we are members of the Commonwealth. Today, we are the chair, and uh, we will try to work with other members of the Commonwealth and make the best use of this opportunity for the benefit of everyone. It is no offense we have committed about that, and we don't apologize for the progress we have made the challenges we have faced. And I hope it is also realized that uh, I have been looking around in this world, I know, to find where everything is rosy and everything is fine. No, no. I, I haven't found that place. I, I, I wish I could find it, maybe. I would learn one thing or two. So. Sorry to consume all the time you, you, on, on this, but it was because of the weight of the question. So, back to you. Thank you very much. I think we've run over significantly on time, I'm afraid. So. The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem, far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one 
African diaspora center of excellence. It will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there. Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering, we pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. We were singing, what you were singing? The masters of the field were coming. We who are boys are coming. The masters of the field are coming. We who are boys are coming. To win the race, to win the race, we trust in God, we trust in God. To win the race, we trust in God. And that's for Opoku Masters mm -hmm. are coming. Masters are coming. Mm -hmm. Masters are coming to win the race. Oh, 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 oh. Masters are coming. And then they will sing. Prepare the world. Prepare the world. Then we go more. Then we will keep quiet. Mm -hmm. Then we will sing. Ah, when they tire, they will come in. Mm -hmm. Diplo, Owens. Diplo warrants are in the field. We have to win the race and take a cup. We are the masters of the field, the best athletes, famous to all and decent boys. How diplo? Then they will start. I've been quiet. I have a eye. I have a eye. I have a eye. I have a eye. Hello, I'm going to go to the coffee quarantine. I'm going to go to the Eh, ilevi, 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 kasana, ya kasagana, ubiare kan ilevi, inti, se se miti bing me, ni ilevi. Because ilevi problem no, e ye simple. Na, Ghana government iso ampeso ye otiase, inti ne ye be chile mwa chile no, no watiase ye. E wusi ya fo, 2020, IMF ma Ghana, 1 billion dollars, billion with the B. Same year, no World Bank ma Ghana 430 million dollars. Nina for COVID. E we you know, in 2021, no IMF for some ma Ghana 1 billion dollars. Bill 1 billion with a B. Now, World Bank for some ma Ghana 130 million dollars. In the 20, uh, 2021, no, so 1 billion, 130 million, yeah, if he World Bank buy any IMF buy, no. Now we say post COVID rejuvenation program, say, what be my young economy, no, so into no, World Bank, the IMF, this is Ghana, Ghana. Ghana government call Bank of Ghana, Koyi, 20 billion cities, say, COVID in T. Now we have what World Bank come with 2 billion. Uh, I am a farmer with two billion. World Bank Amamo, five hundred and sixty million dollars for COVID. I know on some Musan call Bank of Ghana could eat twenty billion CDs. Say COVID in tea. Say I see can we move home content train here. And I won't move. We move here. Baby, I will be for Ghana. E levy tax. We call ports. E levy. We call airport. We call hotels. But they are to to be bearer so Ghana. E levy, e levy, e levy. Says he can hear now for petrol. E levy. Uko union ma port. E levy. Says he can hear now for na. Inti se ne. Government person or chile yeng se. Ghana fu ebi ya adjune ne nye jumenti na ode sa e levy nere ba. Yen su ye pesi ye chile government se. Enye se ya adjune nye jumo ye hu ne kosono ni ye jai amano. If you say, who per se, who nya, he levy, yang, yeah, yeah, responsible citizens, yang per se, yeah, 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 stand by, yet, you know, okay, car, yeah, train fire, yeah, or not, okay, say, yeah, yeah, responsible citizens, right? Into, yeah, yeah, responsible citizens. Now, let's say, say, so who per se, who free sika, not who di ye bribia, because yang credit rating record former, and yeah, yang abra bot, now di e levy, barber to so. Identity because there is over three, almost three billion Ghana cities I recall to the presidency. Three billion Ghana. In it also by 75%. What also by 75%? I will say by 375 million dollars. 375 million. Save and not at the presidency. You don't need three billion Ghana cities going to the presidency. Then now what Mr. Kufuado. And the near cost of 
presidency den na mudi sika ne presidency ho mudi ye den mudi shi usuruku ana den na mudi ye legislator le, Ghana legislators ye wo 275 legislators den na sa legislators no wo ye ma Ghana say say me no mo ka say he Ghana fu ye betumi afa i install it, Watson IBM computer wo fra ni say Watson no ah e ye artificial intelligence a e be ye over 90% of young parliamentarians no ye be tumi replace one with Watson Watson computer be won aduma na ye down skill aden ye here 275 parliamentarians out den wo ye magana one liability to Ghanaians na ye over 100,000 cities every month per parliamentarian 100,000 cities kona ko bun kunta na na he eno achi what was judiciary? Judiciary, hey, America, yeah, 330 million people, 11 times the size of Ghana. Ghana, yeah, 30.8 million. America, were nine Supreme Court judges. A kufuado ba na nsiyeni. Ghana, near were ten Supreme Court judges. A kufuado, our point eight. Akaho, inti say say Ghana, 30, a country of less than 31 million people, no, yeah, were. 18 Supreme Court judges. Then ne how young? 18. Then na aren young na just a kronge wo we are na Ghana ne wunti ye here Supreme Court judges. Then tin ye wo Supreme Court judges. A country of less than 31 million. 18 Supreme Court judges. Ka ka one Supreme Court judge be no liability. Every hundred and fifty thousand dollars, hundred and fifty thousand cities a month. Kona kubun kunta he ne V8 ordered them ne bodyguards ne ne driver ne ne te, ne krone ba deng inti ni yafa an extra eight Supreme Court judges and un kwan cheng say si ameno moka say ye wo thirty four uh, uh, wo friend deng uh, 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 ambassadorial post around the world thirty four Vatican City. Ah, I will room cry. Ye wo ambassador wo ho. Deng na ambassador wo Vatican City ye magana. Munkan chile ye nge. A deng ni ye wo ambassadors wo baby to say Malta nom ne eh, wo friend deng Sri Lanka si eh, su Sudan nom ni ade. Deng o komo na ye ni ade ba inti ni ye wo ambassadors wo Sudan. It doesn't make any kind of sense. Se wo re e levy. What is this? Ye san wo eh, 58 uh, uh, diplomatic missions around the world. Diplomatic mission, no, Anka Hun Fasune said, What will trade desk? Eddie income, commerce, a bre Ghana. So, diplomatic missions around the world, they are 50, 80. Sika Beng, what the bre Ghana. Moon country ain't near here. A year crong waste of money and resource. Musi Muhu, he levy. Ye betcha must say, he levy no moon corner muko ye infimua mut for tomb. Positions now more create a wound in Fasono and Hona Munko infi. A deng na mo ha o gana fo sa a MPP fo. Deng na gana fo a ye munti. Na de biya ye nchi ya se, ye nchi ya se no. Sa a position si na ye wez. He, wo wo over 2,000 executive positions. Wo wo executive benefits ne perks. Wo tu kwang wo business class. Wo nya 4x4 no mo ni ade. Sa a ne mo ni ne si wo yifi ho. Ana wo te o so. E no no be ma i levi no. Income from i levi ni ye be nye fi ho. Mroso, mroso, mroso. Deng necessary ye catch there a kufuad in the government. Says Sadeno, Munko ye in Fihonum, Namu Boka Gana Foka unnecessarily. Namu be ye in a ye na excavator saw Yanko Pandom yen say yen sound coca, nay and nang and yen fan ye see can yen fan two yen ye levy casson. Mabe catch in the Marco show excavators eighty five. Excavators are back on ye over hundred and fifty thousand to two hundred thousand. Massa Uncle Show Nakaho. Na Pan on where he yeezy. Cop no where he a tin where he are no cop no so a wild bonaca home. Hey, a kufuado and his government. Why? Gana fo Yam penende and penetina. He levy no one hour years a bash and one hour while quite free scan was a ba. Yam pen in a lay walk when eh yan mo barber could ye be genome the name and say yer and penny a kufuado and his government. A ding a ding. What's it when? Uh, cluelessness meets unpreparedness. No, MPP infoni na be humo ho. Yabram, we're not gonna take this. We're not having this. Mumfa, 
ye mpene ne mpene tena eleven no ye tia munko inko cut legislature munko cut executive munko cut uh, judiciary nasi kan ambassadors any uh, wo friend uh, uh, ambassador post any uh, ye uh, uh, the diplomatic missions sani amani na mun cancel na mun reduce na mun fa computers in your head legislature say you want 275 no you bet me the drone drone i replace it one you here 275 at the maximum four per region you here 64 parliamentarians you here 211 parliamentarians no where your liability to ghana at about 100,000 cities every month you ain't come on enough of this nonsense you will you will Okay. Okay. So when we are the symbol of knowledge, strength, adaptability, <laughs> energy, freedom, unity, hope, peacemaking, harmony, intelligence, Continue. power of love, strength. Said in class symbols when you are obiabra bobia ebi a boy ye na ne sign and no pepper no na ye di aka and in class symbols in a home. Okay. Now Ghana for tena si ya no se said ye na do nan kwaku for do ebu ne mine ye ni jeho. And see, this is the Edinkra symbol for failure. What? <laughs> it's a free nerdical. So Edinkra symbol, you know ya. I can Edinkra symbol so. Your president is now a it's free nerdical. You know ya. I can Edinkra symbol so. Photo. It's an Edinkra symbol for failure. <laughs> you are a failure. You are a failure. And I beg you and can never make it. Say, Yen and Nanuma Motina see here at the Crassembos. He said, Mummy and Fawi in Kamu. This for the Crassembos for free. I'm about to be here. 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 i am about to be here 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 i am about to